Okay, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Sarah Scarlett and Lauren O'Neill, who are both third year student midwives at the University of the West of Scotland. They were both lucky enough to have the opportunity to travel to Greece to work with Amatil, a charity providing maternity care and much needed holistic support to asylum seeking women and their families. Sarah and Lauren are keen to share their experiences in order to raise awareness and improve the level of care given to vulnerable women across the UK and the world. So I'm just going to pass over to Sarah. Hello. Hi. And um, thank you so much to everybody uh, for joining us today. We're really excited to get to talk about um, our experiences in Greece. Um, so I thought, first of all, we'd maybe just discuss um, the reasons that we wanted to go and just a bit about organising an elective placement. Um, so Lauren, do you want to start? It was kind of your your idea, wasn't it? Lauren yeah. is the brains behind the operation. I just <laughs> made the spreadsheets. <laughs> um, so we, I asked Sarah if she would like to come with me on an elective placement. And what got me interested was, um, it was kind of twofold. One, I saw an advert on Facebook asking for um, volunteers to go to Greece to assist women with breastfeeding support in a refugee camp and with the fundamental um, role, of, role that breastfeeding has for midwives I just thought that would be an excellent opportunity for a student to have to be able to build their skills but also to give something back because it's a very privileged role that we have and the skills that we build are just I felt quite a, a strong connect with giving something back um, and unfortunately, by the time we were able to organise an elective, that opportunity was no longer there. Um, however, everything worked out the way it was meant to, and we found Amartel. Um, and the other reason that we wanted to go is just the fact that Glasgow is a dispersal city in the UK for um, refugee and asylum seeking women. And the just the rich culture of women that we have in Glasgow, um, it just felt like a really good opportunity to learn more about the culture so that we can bring that into our practice when we're back here in Glasgow. And um, so I suppose uh, from a practical point of view, if you're a student midwife and you're interested in arranging an elective, um, our kind of first step was discussing it with the university because really they didn't have the capacity for elective placements prior to us. We kind of uh... <laughs> started a, a revolution. <laughs> So basically all kind of subsequent years now are able to apply for electives. So people have done lots of different things, haven't they? Yep. Like from just, you know, spending a few days at private scan or people have been volunteering with um, different third sector charities mm -hmm. in the UK that support women and families who are perhaps vulnerable, but not necessarily in a maternity context, mm -hmm. just that outreach in the community. Um, and I think just the fact that we kind of opened that door has just made the experience yeah. possible. It wasn't that the university didn't want us to go and do it. It's just no. that no one had ever really approached them about it before. So from our point of view, from making the decision that we wanted to go on an elective placement to actually being able to have the permission from university find a, a slot in the timetable that allowed us to go, and get all of the the paperwork and the forms filled in it was quite a lengthy process mm -hmm. um the original idea to go actually happened in first year and we actually went to greece at the end of our second year so we know from from the students that are coming after us that are in second year now that, that their process is much smoother and um, one of our amazing lecturers shona um has worked really hard on developing um a much easier pathway for students to be able to apply for electives and she's able to help them facilitate their journey much much easier than, mm -hmm. than what she's we did. Incredibly encouraging yeah she's yeah she's kind of really kind of forged that kind of uh, path for the, for the uni curriculum absolutely which is great and um, so Shona was really supportive and really kind of helped us out and helped get all the kind of paperwork in order and then from our point of view our kind of um in terms of organization it was just kind of trying to fundraise and um we wanted to just to get enough money to cover our flights and our accommodation 
Um, so we set up a Just Giving page, which is probably something I would recommend. Um, and we had a kind of expectations that we might be able to just kind of cover the cost of that. Um, but we actually raised way more than just those costs. Yeah. So we were able to make a big donation to Amartel, which was fantastic. It felt really, really good. It was yeah. really nice. The, one of the key things that we found on this journey that we were doing is just how incredibly generous and supportive the people in this midwifery and birth community are. You know, we have friends and family who are, you know, they're supportive of us because they're fr our friends and family, but there were also donations and support from people all across, you know, the world basically, and just people even from logging in to look mm -hmm. at our, our yeah. blog when people we were there. We've never even met, yeah, just being really supportive and giving us encouraging messages and it was quite overwhelming, yeah. something that we probably hadn't considered um, when we started on this journey and, you know, it just made it even more worthwhile for us, I think. Yeah, absolutely. It was great. And we also, um, we had been in contact with Amartel um, and asked them if there was anything that they needed and they said um, uh, kind of uh, basically sanitary wear yep. and breast pads. So we just kind of put a bit of a call out. And we ended well, up with we an absolute mountain. And in <laughs> cases, how many cases did we end up taking? Three big yeah, suitcases yeah. and bags. Uh -huh. um, you know, after we were only going to take hand luggage just for ourselves, for our clothes, and we ended uh -huh. up having to take that plus three huge suitcases full of things that people That's donated. Very creative packing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> the tricks that you learn. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so in terms of organising it, we just agreed the dates with Amartel, um, we booked our flights and it, it just we booked an Airbnb, which is like a five minute walk away from Amartel. So Amartel is a charity that is based in Athens and um, it was started up um, by this absolutely extraordinary <laughs> woman called Didi, who originally, her kind of original work in Athens was when people started to arrive in the ports in Petraeus in Athens. So she kind of set up almost like a caravan yep. um, to provide maternity care and really, really crucially infant feeding support. There's a lot, a lot of other charities working in Greece that have um, proper dedicated breastfeeding support workers at its core. And actually in any humanitarian crisis, breastfeeding support, infant feeding is massively important because obviously people don't have access to um, water, being able to boil water, being able to prepare formula safely, can't afford to buy formula. And I think it's probably quite well known that, you know, vulnerable people are kind of preyed upon often mm -hmm. by formula companies who uh, maybe want to make a bit of money, money. out of other people's suffering. <laughs> um, so, with the work that they they were doing down there was really really quite extraordinary and a lot of the people that kind of started with Didi there are still with Amartel now um, so they kind of moved from the port into bigger premises uh, within the city centre and um, and that was where they were at when we arrived. Yep so when they when Amartel first moved into Victoria Square a lot of the refugees were actually had left the, the camps because of um, you know, just overcrowding and the, the the government couldn't get them housed quickly enough. And we know that even today there are still, you know, vast amounts of overcrowding in camps in Greece, all over Greece. Um, so the reason that DD chose Victoria Square was because that was where refugees were camping out in tents. You know, they'd made their way from the coast into the city and that was where Amartel needed to be. They, they wouldn't have to travel to um, access the services. The workers at Amartel could walk about the square and they could see the pregnant women, they could approach them, they could do outreach work. And that was how Amartel started to kind of get the, have themselves known in Greece and spread the word about the work um, that they were doing. So from from um, Dee Dee and the, the women at Amartel having to go to do outreach till um, 2018 when Sarah and I were there and women were just, you know, lining up at the door in the morning for for Amartel to open, they were spreading the word themselves, friends were bringing in friends, it just, it's incredible the work that they've done in such a short space of time and the, the, really yeah. the, the difference that they've made to so many people is just incredible. Um, so I think 
uh, just now. If anybody does have any, any questions about that, we'll move on to our next slide. Um, does anybody have any questions, anything yet? Any comments? Okay, okay. Um, so I'm just going to talk a bit about uh, the women that we met, where they came from and how they get to Europe and what kind of happens then. There we go. So these are just some of the um, figures from last year um, about people traveling to uh, Europe. So the main kind of entry points would be Spain, Italy and Greece. So a lot of the women that we met there, they were from the Middle East. So Afghanistan, Iraq and Syria, of course. Um, we had met women who had trekked for days and days and days on end through mountains, nothing with them but their underwear when they arrived and um, with children heavily pregnant we met other women from africa so we met women from the congo and um, eritrea and um, a lot of those african women had been uh, trafficked for the purposes of sex or exploitation by the time they arrived in europe um, and they've kind of made these really perilous journeys across the sea um, I'm sure that everybody's kind of seen those, you know, terrifying images um, and you just think, you know, what, what, uh, what power these women have actually. Um, and, you know, we see refugees and their asylum seekers as a vulnerable group, but actually um, there was a midwife that's talking to us this week. She uh, is the lead midwife for caring for asylum seekers in Glasgow. She's really wonderful. And um, she, she made a point that really kind of, I totally agree with, she said, you know, my my clients the women that i work for they are empowered you know they are the most powerful people that i have ever met and she's completely right you know you see somebody who's kind of vulnerable before you but actually when you think about the strength and um, to to do what they've done and the journeys that they've made it's just extraordinary um, and you can see there that um, the number of people that kind of made those journeys that are dead or missing is 1,530. And actually uh, the year before that in 2017, there was 3,139. And in 2016, the number of people that died on those journeys was over 5,000. Um, so obviously they're just figures, they're just statistics, they're, not num they're just numbers um, and the European Union seems to be slightly obsessed with the numbers of migrants coming in. If you look at Lebanon, for example, which is adjacent to Syria, they have 1.5 million Syrian refugees. We've got 2,000 in Scotland. Scotland has got the same population size as Lebanon. So when people talk about a crisis in Europe, I think that they're yeah. grossly exaggerating <laughs> the problem. And this is obviously a, a wealthy part of the world. Um, so anyway, that's my political rant over and move on to the next slide. Um, so I just want to talk a bit about the difference between a refugee and an asylum seeker um, and what I don't know if anybody wants to join in their experiences of, of working with these women. Um, so a refugee is somebody who's received their asylum status. So a lot of the women that we were working with were asylum seekers. So they were waiting um, and one of the women that we were working with from Afghanistan, she was, she'd was been waiting for over two years to receive her um, refugee status. Um, whereas the Syrians kind of had a, almost like a fast track process just because the scale of um, the devastation um, in that country, the European Union has prioritized uh, giving asylum to those women. Um, So uh, obviously a big part of what we're doing uh, also involves the maternity care that's given in Greece, um, which was fascinating yeah. coming from the UK. <laughs> you think European country, you think it's going to be relatively similar. Um, it's not. So, <laughs> um, I wonder if Lauren, you'd like to talk a bit about what we learned and yeah. who we met. Um, we were very lucky when we were there to be able to have an insight into the three main types of maternity care in Greece um, through meeting an independent midwife, a private midwife and a public hospital midwife. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so in Greece, 
they have a 40% unemployment rate. Um, they have, they just have a bit of a, a crisis going on and yet they have opened their, their country and their arms to all of these um, asylum seekers coming, coming in. But what that's doing is putting an extra strain on the, the public health system. So a lot of women will seek care from independent or private midwives during their maternity care. So an independent midwife, um, we think costs about in the region of 3,500 euros. And those independent midwives, I think there's about four, did we say 40? Yeah, oh Around about in the kind of Greater Athens area. So the Greater Athens area has a, a population similar to Scotland, just under 5 million. Um, and, you know, with a 40% unemployment rate and some of the people that we met are actually paying, if you, you are working, you're much he more heavily taxed. So for example, a doctor earning a, a decent salary will be paying 75% tax. So money is kind of tight. So to, to find three and a half thousand euros for maternity care is, you know, these women, they know what they want. They know that they, they want to have the best care available to them. Um, it's just not, uh, it's not an option for everyone. Um, with regards to the private care, it's about the same same cost, but your private maternity care um, gets you care, not just from a midwife, but also from a doctor. So midwives and, and obstetricians will work in partnership. And the private midwife that we met um, is actually married to an obstetrician and she trained here in Scotland. So it was really nice to meet her um, and hear about her story. Um, having gone through kind of similar training to where we're at just now. Um, and part of the, the allure of private care and working with um, a midwife and a doctor in Greece is that it actually goes kind of quite against what Sarah and I have learned is that um, it comes with a five night hospital stay and nursery care. So one of the, the selling points for private midwifery care in Greece is that they'll actually take your baby away during the night to let you heal and rest. Um, so we were very interested to hear that given how much we are working in Scotland and the UK towards keeping mums and babies together and never separating them. But again, women are paying a lot of money for this because they're being told that it's, you know, it's best for them, it's best for their health to, to be able to have a rest and, and heal after the birth. Um, and then when we went to um, the public hospital, <clears throat> there are two kind of extremely large public hospitals. Um, near the centre of Athens that we kind of went to when it was a bit further out in the greater Athens area. It was about a 40 minute um, journey from the centre and um, we went, it was one of the, the few hospitals in Greece that have received their baby friendly accreditation from UNICEF for breastfeeding and one of the few that has rooming in with the babies and the mums um, in the public uh, maternity care you can still access better care if you have more money. So if you access public health care and you have money to pay um, for the doctor, you're likely to get your cesarean section faster. You're likely to get one-to-one -one care. For the women that we were working with, the asylum seekers, they just don't have that money. Um, and quite often they were at the bottom of the chain. They also don't have money for things like interpreters. They don't have money for... Um, you know, antenatal education the same way that we do in this country. So a big, big difference. Um, some of the other kind of statistics that we, we were kind of shocked to hear was the extremely high episiotomy rate, um, the extremely high cesarean section rate is up to sort of 70% in some hospitals. And that's so in some of the private ones was it almost up at 90%. Yep. And that's just because the doctors can then plan their life. They can go and, and have their weekends and women can also plan and know that they're not coming into uncertainty and that you know if they, they can give the doctor some money that they can sort of have a little bit of control in this kind of <clears throat> un uncertain system. Um, something else that shocked us in the public hospitals was the neonatal services. The in the big two big hospitals in the centre of Greece they only allow access to parents for two um, visits a day to see their babies so half an hour in the morning and half an hour at night um which just I, I i think we were we were shocked to say i said we were going to a european country 2018 and we just kind of felt almost like we had gone back into the 1950s or something 
Um, yeah, absolutely, Max. Max. Feeling very grateful for the NHS. Very grateful. And I would say as well that every midwife that we met, regardless of whether they were private or working in a public or independent, because we met one of each, and um, said, "Stay in the UK. Yeah, Stay absolutely. where you are. You're so lucky. You don't know how lucky you are to have the system you have there." And honestly it yeah. really really gave you a bit of perspective on how lucky came on very here. grateful and actually interestingly the private midwife we met and the, pub, the public hospital midwife had both spent time either training or working in the uk That's right, yeah. so they had had experience of working within the two systems and both of them were doing their own little things it was really inspiring to see that even in this kind of you know huge pressure system that they were both working away doing their own little things to make things better for women um, as much as you can when you're in a system mm -hmm. um, that you know is under such strain and yeah um, could you tell the story about um, leaving the doors open that's quite a nice story yes uh, so the um, private midwife that we met who is married to the obstetrician has worked in Greece now for 18 years was it 15 yeah, so 18 she years Scottish so she yeah she trained in Scotland yeah. and she met her husband working in London working in a big hospital in London um, and they moved back to Greece because he's Greek and she um one of the things that we saw in the public hospitals or we heard in the public hospital when we visited was the that you know privacy isn't a huge thing for them um it's much easier when you they don't have one-to-one -one care necessarily the way that we do so it's much easier to keep, keep control of everything if the doors are opened um but the midwife in the private hospital has just been working away for years um trying to change that so she had raised the issue with with the sister on the the in the hospital and you know they, they couldn't quite reach an agreement about closing the doors so this midwife just started closing the doors so every time she would walk past the door that was open she would close it on a woman who was in labor given that privacy she would come back maybe an hour later and the door would be open so she would close it again so she would just keep work kept working away doing her thing until the culture started changing other people started closing doors and eventually now she showed us some pictures. She's actually now at the stage where the, the private hospital she's working in has been renovated. And um, she is actually having a birthing pool installed, dim, you know, light dimmers in the room, just creating this, creating this change that's taken her years and years to get, you know, get infiltrated in the system, but creating amazing changes for women. And just you know, shifting that culture, little changes um, yeah. lead to big changes in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. It's like you say there, Ali. You know, every every little kind of bit counts. You know, and it may seem like a small thing, but actually, you know, we know we know about you know the physiology of labour and needing to be in you know a safe, comfortable environment where you're not being watched. You know, how are we expecting women to labour? And then I suppose you look at their statistics that they're section rates and yeah. all of that is really down to uh who has the control you yeah. know who has the control in that room um and it's not certainly not the woman no and it's just as you see ellie it's about making these little changes to um change the change the power shift you know give the power back to the women mm -hmm. because it's their bodies it's their birth it's their moment and as sarah says we know all of the evidence that surrounds it um, but even just on a, a purely common sense and just kind and compassionate level, mm -hmm. you know, at this completely private and vulnerable moment, you, I wouldn't want the door to be open. So very interesting. Wow, that's really interesting, Ali, what you're saying there. Three bedded bay, no pa silence. Wow. Um, how do you, how, how do you place that? <laughs> was there a pressure on women to be silent? Yeah, if they made any noise, they um, were tapped on the foot and, and told to be quiet. Oh um, my and goodness. they were often naked um, and had to just lie on their back and wait. As soon as they were classified as being in established labour, they were moved to this three bedded bay without any birthing partners and just left to, to birth in silence, really. Yeah. There, was a, 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 there was a great physiological expectation that they would just birth naturally um, it was a bit of a surprise if they ended up with any complications and had to, to go to theatre so it was nice to see that kind of physiological belief that their bodies could do it but it was also a bit startling to see this isolation and loneliness as well a little bit in this very yeah. intimate time 
And who else would be in the room with them? So if you had three women, would there be three midwives or how did that kind of work? There would the, the midwives did congregate, but they were they just chatted to each other. They didn't pay much attention to the women at all. Wow. Listened in once an hour, um, and that that was it. They were just left to get on with it, and then um, they just sort of announced when they felt they were ready to push. It was very eye opening. And how did you feel like within that environment? Did you feel like in a position to be able to challenge some of that, or? It was a little bit difficult because of the, the language barrier, particularly with the women. The midwives, um, they, they, they were a little bit rude to the women sometimes um, when they were making noise. They didn't understand why they needed to, and it was a bit of attention seeking they saw it as. Um, wow. But they also, they just had this belief, which I was amazed at, because I think in England, sometimes that belief that physiological processes can happen has gone yeah 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 i would agree with that um and i think yeah if you look up right across europe actually well and the i mean look at the states as yeah. well you know the kind of maternal outcomes that they're having over there um not good that's well it's interesting isn't it because it's trying to find that balance between um you know safe maternity care safe and respectful maternity care it's 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 so i yeah. feel like it, depending on whether you're in a developed country or developing country you kind of it, it drastically yeah, part of the of, spectrum aren't you yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i think we have lessons to learn from each other yeah Absolutely. exactly yeah that's yeah. a really excellent point yeah definitely um and also just like what where midwives fit into all of that you know like you know i think midwives in the uk are as a general rule it's quite a respected profession mm -hmm. and i think yeah. in the working environment midwives are respected by their colleagues you know not obviously not in every case but largely there's respect between the multidisciplinary team but in greece there's no national guidelines you know they don't have nice they don't have hospital policies and protocols and basically as a result of that it means that anybody more senior than you can throw you under the bus so because you, you, you can't have done you it can't really say, I have followed our hospital guidelines mm -hmm. or I have followed national guidelines. This is what I did. So somebody more senior than you can say, well, if I was in that situation, this is what I would have done. So you've got, there's no support for you. Um, you know, which is why everybody's just scared. Yeah, so. And of course you have a culture of fear here as well. But I think, I think over there, it's actually, it's worse. It's a vulnerable place to be a junior midwife or doctor in the, the healthcare system in Greece yeah. and the statistics from 2018 where that of the midwives who qualified only 40% of those were going to work as midwives so we were losing they're losing 60% of the people that they're training to but be also midwives. There's, no, there's no role for a midwife there they're obstetric nurses so I don't really know why they're bothering to train midwives if they're not yeah. allowing for midwifery within the maternity yeah. care system they're not utilizing them um and um just kind of going back to what uh, linda was saying about iran i think sarah and i have both heard linda speak yeah, about her did, time in yeah. iran which was a great um presentation and very interesting for us as we were yeah, first years at the time absolutely yeah um but i um had been as a first year student midwife after hearing that talk um i cared for a woman who had had her first two children in Iran. So she was having her third child here in Glasgow and her partner did not know what to do with himself. He was beside himself because it was just not done. None of his male friends, none of his male family members had ever been in when their partners had given birth. Um, and your talk really kind of came back to me at that time, Linda, because I, I had that awareness um, from hearing your talk. So yeah, thank you for sharing with us. Absolutely. Um, and for you know the, the women that we were kind of uh, caring for, um, when they arrived uh, over to Greece, over to Europe, you know, obviously that's gonna be a massive culture shift for them. But you know, when they arrive in hospital and labor, their partner's not allowed in with them. They don't have an interpreter. They don't know the culture. They don't know the language. They're completely alone. I mean, it's just extraordinary that they managed to navigate their way through it. Yeah. And Amartel, who we were working with, had a hospital system. Um, I think actually it might be a bit more better on there. Um, they had a, a 
It's like a buddy system yeah, for the hospitals. Yeah. So they had um, a cultural mediator. Cultural mediator, yeah. So they had um, a Farsi translator and they had an Arabic translator who would go with the women to the hospital for their appointments. So um, Amartel provides uh, a midwifery antenatal appointments and they do ultrasound, but um, they don't do the uh, what would be over here, your 12 week scan and your 20 week scan. So they don't do the anomaly scan. So you'd need to go to um, the hospital for that. And they also do a Doppler in Greece as well. Uh, and Greece every part. woman gets a glucose tolerance test also. Mm -hmm. um, although very interesting in terms of being an, uh, an evidence-based practitioner because of all the midwives that we've spoken to, I think one of them had worked with a woman who had gestational diabetes once, but yet they have this kind of every single woman gets a, a glucose tolerance test. So because there are no guidelines, we it was hard for us to kind of navigate and see why they do the tests that they do and where their thought process kind of yeah. comes from. And they also gave, you know, like in the UK, um, all babies are offered vitamin K at birth, whether that's injection or oral drops. But in Greece, they did that, but they also gave, there was other vitamins, wasn't there? Vitamin D, everybody vitamin got. D, all the babies got vitamin D as well. Um, and it was about 40 degrees when we were there, sunny every <laughs> single day. I think the only people that probably needed the vitamin D were Sarah and I, and our nice kind of <laughs> <laughs> Scottish and Irish paleness. <laughs> um, but yeah, interesting because as student midwives going through this journey where, you know, we're constantly learning about evidence and we're learning to navigate an evidence-based um, profession to go to Greece and it was just you know your luck of who you got and how they wanted to practice that day was quite it was interesting wasn't it yeah. it's also uh, just going back to midwifery training in Greece a lot of the midwives were able to get their statutory numbers you have to have in the UK you have to have your fourth births and there and that's an Same. EU directive so that's right across all EU countries you need to get your 40, 40 babies yep. and um, all of your antenatal checks, post checks, but they weren't able to catch babies because there's such a high C-section rate. So for a lot of those student midwives, catching a placenta counts as delivering a baby yep. in your statutory numbers, which we both found quite shocking. Yes, and when we met one kind of recently qualified two years ago, um, a midwife, she was absolutely ecstatic to tell us that she'd caught 41 babies and they were actually babies. So that was that was how we found out about this because we oh, were yeah, both saying, like, what, hmm, what, do what do you mean actual, actual babies? <laughs> As opposed to... <laughs> um, Five minutes. Okay, oh, yeah, that's grand. Yeah, I'll just uh, scoot on to the next slide. Um, so yeah, just a kind of rundown of some of the different kind of services that Amartel gives. So... Um, they do, they do also work as a distribution centre, so they provide baby kits which have got um, some clothes, nappies, wipes, mosquito um, nets, that, yeah, kind, of that kind of thing. And they also have regular donations of kind of like Moses baskets, which the women love. Yes. Um, and they also distribute food. Um, but they had quite a good system in that if you came to an educational class, then you could go in and you yes. know, get some underwear or get some food or... And I think it's a really good system because it means that they can come in, they can rest, they can learn something, they can meet some other people. It's practical for them as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, actually one of the, the um, lovely listeners today, Mags McCall is a midwife from Glasgow and she is heading over to Amartel. Um, um, yep, nice. shortly. And Max has collected 500 bras, is that right, Max? <laughs> wow! <laughs> so um, Max is heading to Amartel. She's also got a fundraising page, and um, so she's raising money for Amartel. And um, maybe you could share that link with yeah. us, Max. That would be really good. Um, they yeah. are extraordinary yeah. because, you know, caring for a woman isn't just about the kind of the antenatal care or the postnatal care that she's receiving it's also providing a safe space for women to meet each other you know a lot of these women come from cultures where um they have their family around them and you know having children you know you've always got a support network and they don't have anyone they come with potentially nobody yeah. no friends no family all on their own 
and coming to Armatel, they're able to meet other f- people. They make they make such good friends. Yeah, it's like, such a supportive it's community. It's the nicest atmosphere to be in because you just see all of these friendships being formed. And Armatel, um, they they say that everybody that comes to them tells them it's from word of mouth. They yep. heard from somebody else, so they are kind of, you know, they're they're talking to their friends. They're saying, you know. This is a great place yes. to come. They do classes. They do baby massage, which is just gorgeous. Yeah. And so all of the classes are run in both Arabic and Farsi. Um, so you've kind of got that kind of peer-to-peer support. But in addition to that, Amartel, uh, they've been doing a training program for infant nutrition. So um, some of the refugees that come have been learning to become infant nutrition teachers themselves. And um, so that's amazing. Oh, They've all incredible. graduated now and they're, you know, they're just yeah. so... We've got to see some of them sat in on their classes, yep. And yeah. also the you see how it makes them feel, you know. So confident. These are strong women, as Sarah already said. They're strong, they're independent, they're already empowered. They've made this decision. You know, the words that they, some of the words that they used to, to tell us why they made the decision was because they wanted their children to have a life. Mm-hmm. They wanted their children to be human. They wanted... To, they're all here for the same purpose so that you know initially bonds them but also to see them now you know furthering themselves in this new environment it's just absolutely incredible and they just all want you they just all build each other up and they just all want each other to to go further and they just want all of their children to to just have a better life and it's just what dd and amartel have created is beyond incredible and mags has just posted the just given link so if you've got a couple of pounds to spare that would absolutely help them um pop onto their website and see you know find out more about them we can't we just we can't see enough about them can we just wonderful and they have um a a playroom as well for kind of older children so if, if pregnant women are coming for appointments or if they're coming for classes it means that there's a safe space for the kids to be and there's always somebody in there playing with the children and yeah it's just lovely really just special yes such a nice it's, environment to be in it's just yeah when mags you'll know once you go it's just it's the you just when you walk in that door it just feels like a safe place it just feels like a good place to be and oh, yeah it's amazing. DD is amazing. I think you've enthused us all to go to Greece. <laughs> let's all go. Yes, let's all go. Let's go. <laughs> does, does anybody have any questions for Sarah or Lauren? If you have a mic, we can have it audibly or if you have them in the public chat. Any questions? Or maybe you've been on a, an elective and have seen some amazing things to share. No. Yeah. So, can you sum up in one sentence why somebody, uh, as a student, should go on an elective placement? Um, it's just so important to get outside of yourself. It literally <laughs> changed my whole life. It's just changed. It was such a transformative experience for me. I've learned so much about myself as a person, about myself as a future midwife. The bond that Sarah and I have in our friendship has been cemented and it was just an absolutely incredible opportunity to meet these amazing, strong, powerful women and bring some of their culture home, you know, to help other people feel like Glasgow is their new home. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, we just keep saying to everyone at UWS, go on, a, go on an elective, go on yeah. an elective. There'll be no students left. We'll all be on electives. <laughs> It's just so it's just so important to get a bit of perspective during mid, your midwifery training yes it really is um i think it's it's because it's full on you know I, i'm sure everybody knows the ups and the downs that you go through while you're training to be a midwife and i think it's very very easy to get caught up in the system mm-hmm. and sometimes forget who you are and why you're doing it um, and who and you're doing your, it for true motivation is yeah um and I think just kind of getting outside of your own world really, really, really helps. Um, really helps you to kind of find yourself in that again. And um, you know, diversity is strength. And um, you know, if you fear if you fear a difference, then you don't, you're not going to learn anything, are you? 
<laughs> need to embrace it. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences and oh, uh, inspiring, so us all, inspiring us all to take up another elective if we've already done one or to go on one if we haven't. 